Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Gonna go the windy way today. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna turn that off. Oh no! I'm behind a tractor. Very typical. They pull out, look, here comes another one. Oh no, that's the that's the dustman. Dustman didn't come a fortnight ago, so now I've got four boxes of cardboard to go out. And they said, no, leave it out, leave it out. We'll do an extra collection. Like, will the echoes like? Now, what are you doing? I'll tell you what, I don't want to get anywhere near you. I'm getting impaled on the back of one of them. Whatever it is, that's some sort of soil aerator, isn't it? Anyway, hope you're well. Hope you're well. We've had a, we've got a half a dozen low pressure areas. Excuse me. And the sun has just come out. And I've got this thing where I sneeze if the sun shines in my eyes. Oh. And uh, it's very difficult to find a clear explanation of why. But the best one I can come up with is that my olfactory nerve runs very close to my optical nerve. So when the olfactory, uh, when the optical nerve is overloaded, the olfactory nerve gets a sort of a crossover signal and uh, gets irritated and therefore I sneeze. Anyway, I was going to talk about the uh, the absolute dearth of NHS, uh, and I'm going to give you the one syllable version because honestly, you could go into so much detail over this. But broadly speaking, I think it's just a failure of. Uh, uh, governance, how can I put it? Do you remember my cascading failure theory? Where if you do something wrong, then uh, as time goes by, everything else gets done wrong. Because the one decision influences many other decisions. So like failing to clarify and classify Bitcoin as a currency is one decision that's going to you know, cause a load of trouble. And uh, the governance uh, system in this country, it may be, as uh, Winston Churchill said, uh, better than any alternative, but uh, it certainly doesn't mean that it's good or that it works very well under all, any circumstances. Uh, so you've got, uh, you, you know, at the top of it basically, you've got Parliament that passes laws. And, you know, there's there's a RSS feed from Parliament. You can get new laws sent to you every day. And you'll get about somewhere between 10 and 20 laws sent through to you every working day. Um, and I'd say 70% of them are just uh, the such and such bypass act or the temporary restriction of flying Duxford Act or uh, very 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 few are in the uh, order of you know anything I would call substantive legislation so they are informed by uh, their constituents letters and also the work of their specialist subcommittees in the case of dentistry that's Health Select Subcommittee, which I've given evidence to a, co evidence to a couple of times. Um, but they really don't, uh, you know, they're, they're not, although they are, you see, they're ultimately their source of power, um, they, they're lazy. <laughs> they spend all their time getting elected and screwing their researchers. So, um, basically what they do is they delegate 
and they delegate too much. They delegate to, uh, uh, well, let's just say they delegate to, uh, they delegate their authority to people like the Department of Health or the various quangos that are, what are they called, arm's length bodies now. So that they can get on with doing the, the, the former. And and so when you get an inquiry, as there have been, so there are various dental inquiries once every 10 years or so, um, into things like dentistry, uh, you tend to find that they're very sort of, uh, on the face of it, they're quite granular, but then nothing really ever comes as a result of it. They're, they're too really easily frustrated. Um, so what happens is that the uh, service becomes a, a sort of a very centralised service, um, very far removed from market forces, which are or were the thing that uh, led to such improvements in productivity uh, in the years between about 1950 and 1990, uh, led to led to you know NHS dentistry being a thriving. A thriving sector when I qualified in 81 but um, it's, it's pretty much gone downhill ever since to the point where I I, I pretty much pronounced it extinct uh, this year and the reason for that as I say is it's been in my opinion it's been through a case of uh, centralization uh, micromanagement making things less efficient less uh, responsive nimble uh, less aligned with uh, the oral health needs of the people who they tax. And I think, uh, I do think everyone has a right to the benefits to which they're asked to contribute. You know, if you're asked to pay national insurance, then I think you do have the right to um, uh, the benefits which are arise out of that authority's tax. And it just so happens that uh, a national health service that's generally available to everybody free at the point of delivery is is nominally what is created by that riot. Now, in practice, of course, uh, national insurance is nothing more than another tax. And we're looking at it increasingly in the context of a state that is unable to levy enough tax to pay for itself they are in America for example 24% of their income this year was uh, came from central government <clears throat> and that is included in the gross domestic product so when they're looking at how efficient they are how much money they're making as you know what their salary is as a country they include all the money that's uh, uh, the, the income that's derived from government handouts or transfer payments as they call them um, is is included so if things are looking rosy it's only because uh, social security is is regarded as a uh, a, by, a, a productive uh, byproduct you know a byproduct of, of uh, economic activity well, which it clearly isn't I mean most people do realise that uh, government has no money, only what it takes from from everyone else. But my point is that um, we got to the point now where uh, the tax, as such, uh, needs to be regarded as not not paying for government, not paying for the activities of government, but for really just being a, a redistributive. In other words, if you decide that one sector in society has has got more money than you'd like them to have and another sector has got less, then you use taxation to try and pick a few winners and losers, you know, tra transfer the money around. But the actual cost of uh, government and the armed forces and social security benefits and uh, pensions and things like that, that comes from printing money. That doesn't come from taxations. It's actually the costs of government now are borne by 
um, everybody who's got pounds or anything denominated in pounds uh, losing its purchasing power as a result of the debasement of the currency through overprinting and that as a tax and it is a tax is um, I mean you could say that in, in a way it's sort of reasonably progressive because it affects a rich person much more than it does a poor person doesn't it I mean if you debase the currency and reduce the purchasing power of a pound uh, then it affects someone who's got 10 pounds far more than someone who's got one pound because uh, they've got more things that are being debased if you see what I mean but in practice it doesn't really work like that because uh, rich people tend to uh, not to <laughs> tend to be a bit clever about keeping their uh, wealth in hard assets like uh, stately piles and uh, gold and uh, shares which tend to benefit from the debasement and uh, uh, you know and other, other hard assets and not uh, really don't and they don't rely on cash whereas of course your average uh, factory worker he's only got his wages which are paid in pounds, perhaps you know, a couple of hundred quid in a deposit account, denominated in pounds, and uh, 20 quid in his pocket is just taken out of the cash point. And all of that, all of that gets debased. And um, and so, you know, and, and also, I mean, all of it is used, all of it is necessary. Whereas a rich person, you know, could afford to lose half their income and they would still be able to afford themselves and, and buy a nice car and look after their kids and that. Whereas um, someone who's sort of very much on the breadline, who loses half the purchasing power of their money, uh, is going to be in big trouble because they, they will have severe trouble paying for the rent and keeping food on the table, etc, etc. So... This failure of um, uh, remuneration or the purchasing power um, of the remuneration to keep up with the uh, expenses and the various uh, vagaries of the micromanaged system, things like the completely useless Care Quality Commission and uh, the, the highly expensive and equally useless General Dental Council, um, has just led to market forces taking over and as a result uh, <clears throat> you know you can't even in healthcare you can't work the impossible you can't you know if you've got uh, 100 pounds worth of need and you've only got 80 pounds worth of budget then you're going to have 20 pounds worth of unmet need and if you've signed a contract to say that you'll meet that need, the £100 worth of need, and you've accepted in return an £80 budget, then that's, that is very much your problem, you know. I, still, I would still say that you can't, uh, you won't, you can't meet that need, you'll still, the need will still be unmet. But you're, the, you're playing into the hands, aren't you, of the people who say, well, no, all that need has been met because we've contracted someone who said that they can deal with it you know who can someone's offered to take that uh, problem off our hands yeah so then to sort of drift away from the NHS I think uh, slowly 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 and then and uh but the NHS the mandarins at Whitehall and Richmond House are in a bubble. I remember uh, going to a meeting, uh, opening of a new chain of dental practices called Genesis, that was being entire, done entirely as a sort of pet project of someone, uh, and probably almost entirely funded by public money, grants, etc. 
Genesis was the name was very carefully chosen to you know to mean new birth and new start and also to appeal to uh, anyone who's sort of a bit religious quasi religious and and it went nowhere you know it was supposed to be the new dawn for the NHS the new high quality NHS that was promised um, well, just by the Department of Health or by the dentists who, who were after the money you know they, they said no look you know what you're paying you should easily be able to get a, a high quality service and uh, I, I spoke to a dentist and I said look you know um, he was standing next to the chief dental officer I'm sure that's no coincidence and said to him look, how, how can you make chrome dentures when the fee for the chrome framework alone is more than the fee you're going to get paid for the entire course of treatment including the checkup, the x-rays the fillings, the root treatments and the extractions and uh, the bloke standing next to him said well I, I can do it, he said I, I don't find it any problem at all and I said really you know are you a dentist in the real world <laughs> can I reach out and touch you <laughs> and he said yeah yeah absolutely he says absolutely not a problem and uh, I've actually <laughs> You know, that's an attitude I came across when I was a student at dental school. And you've got uh, uh, students of a certain type who come from a certain type of public school could look you straight in the face and say black was white, you know. That they, they didn't sleep with your girlfriend, blah, 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 that you got it all wrong. Blah, and, and be very convincing about it. And he was absolutely straight-faced, told me that he could do crumbs on the NHS. No trouble at all. And... Uh, I said to him, I, I said the same thing which I always say, which is, which totally disarms these people, which is that, look, would you mind awfully if I came and just spent the day at your practice and see how you do it, you know? Can I just see how, uh, could you show me? Because, uh, you know, obviously best practice and all that, spread best practice. Why don't you come and, why don't I come and just learn from you? And then of course the answer is, oh no, no, I'm sorry. That's not possible. No, we can't do that. We can't do that. And of course they can't do that because they don't do that. You know, you, you will never see them doing that because they, that doesn't get done. And uh, it's just a lie, you know, it's just a lie. Uh, and it was the same when uh, they brought in HTMO 105, the anti-cross-infection uh, protocol. And uh, I said that it's impossible in an, N in an NHS practice to incorporate the, or everything that they uh, ask you to do. And uh, a couple of people said, yeah, no, there's no, there shouldn't be any problem at all doing that. And I said, well, I'd like to challenge you. In fact, it was a general challenge at that point. I said, anybody, anybody who's working on the NHS who feels that they're doing good quality work and complying with HTMO 105 in every respect, uh, can I just, in the, for the, for the purposes of um, promulgating best uh, policy and all that, spend a day with you, and then and I will, when I see that, I will then publicly recant, say I was wrong, and I'll tell everybody how you do it. N never, ever, never, ever got an invite. Uh, oh, well. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, broadly speaking, you can only buck the market for so long, you know. You can't, uh, if you're going to give £10 notes away for a fiver, which is what you were doing, you know, I mean, we estimated that uh, at one point, obviously it was a few years ago now, but it probably hasn't shifted too much since, that the cost of... Um, carrying out treatment to a high standard was was approximately three times what the NHS paid um, and that uh, everything basically you know what what followed from that was that everything two-thirds of the value that was put into high quality work was was literally donated by the dentist and that's where you've got such a lot of um, cross subsidy you had this model whereby the dentist had to do, had to do, 
both NHS and private at the same time. Um, the private really was to subsidise the NHS and the NHS was to uh, act as a feeder for the private work. And if you went along and suggested to the dentist that he, you know, why wasn't he working entirely on the NHS or entirely privately, that was, you know, they, they would react quite badly to that because they knew and you knew that um, they wanted NHS patients even though they made a loss on them because they acted as a, they were a fertile breeding ground. I mean, you need a bunch of people to be able to say, um, you know, your gums are in a terrible shape, you need to come and see my hygienist, but privately, or, um, you know, I can, you need a crown, <clears throat> but I can do you a crown on the NHS that looks like a, a polo mint, you know, sort of Armitage Shanks type crown, or I can do you a crown privately, uh, which looks like a tooth. You know, which would you prefer? I mean, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and so, of course, the, the NHS uh, drove the private side of the practice, which made the money, and then uh, the uh, and the private private side then cross subsidised the, the small amount of loss you made on the NHS prank patients because nobody really got any work done on the NHS. They were only they they were sort of suckered in for a checkup only to be told that they'd be better off going private. Um, and these um, patients were, they were all like, oh look, an NHS dentist, you know, oh. There is an NHS, no, I'm not coming to see you privately, I found an NHS dentist. And you're like, okay, you know, let's see how much NHS dentistry you've actually found. And of course there's the, the uh, inevitable bending of the rules with that, because the, the NHS is not stupid and I mean, not not to the extent that they didn't know that uh, this uh, mixing was going on, and and did try to stop it. Insofar as they said, um, you know, they would take action against anybody found doing something privately, which could have been done on the NHS. And so they brought in forms, and they said the patient had to sign to make sure they understood they're having stuff privately. But you know, they still can't. Uh, you know, you still can't. Even if the patient signed, you can't know what they were told or what they understood or what they'd heard from their neighbours about what happens to them if they don't sign it. And they, or you know, or or um, <clears throat> you know, obviously you're in complete control of the patient at that point. You can't. You can suggest to the patient that they might have a crown and then see what they what their attitude is, you know, what their initial response is and then see if if you think they might be more amenable to having it done privately, then you can say, yeah, I think I think you definitely do need one. But if they say, oh, is that included in uh, what I've already paid? You can say, well, um, you know, should we decide to do one in the future, then we'll have to look at it at that point, you know. So the government's on the hiding to nothing. It's, dentists are too close to their patients they're not that's why um, you know if dentists get pissed off then the government in trying to reach the patients directly through the media or through I mean they've even advertised on petrol pump handles where I am um, but nothing beats the dentist who the patient's known for a long time just whispering in their ear and saying, you know, oh, Mr. So-and-so, our local MP, he's being a right pain in the arse over dentistry. He won't do this and he won't do that. And um, the patient's like, oh, okay, you know, and it's a captive audience, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. They can't, the dental profession has got a massive uh, power of, uh, a massive influence over uh, the, patient, the patient base. It tends to be the patient base that doesn't attend that swallows what the government says and the patient base that does attend uh, tends to be a little bit more in the know and a bit more savvy and uh, you know and it's enjoying the uh, the benefits of the fruits of the national insurance that everyone's paying for and which they're the only ones that have managed to um, make work it's 
still, as I said, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't micromanage the service. They took this, they took the, uh, the management of the service out of the hands of, of dentists in about 1988, 1992, and said it was going to become centrally managed, whereas before we were self-employed subcontractors. They used to just tell us how much we were going to get paid for doing various bits of work and then let us organise who needed to be um, worked on and, and make sure that the work was of a sufficient standard that patients would come back. Once you get centralised, it's a bit like, um, it was a bit like nationalisation, you know. You could set up your own surgery and you could, on day one, uh, all you had to do was write to Eastbourne and tell them that you were qualified and they would issue, uh, give you a like a provider number and um, then on day one you just open your doors and whoever walked in you you did the work and sent in a claim form I mean there were limits on various limits you know more financial than clinical uh, more designed to slow down payments out of the budget more rather than uh, uh, based on what patients needed, but you know that we we always complained about that. Um, but then, but now, of course, you know we are we've been effectively nationalised. We're the worst kind of nationalisation because all our rights to work have been nationalised, and all our uh, obligations to pay their expenses have, have stayed in the private sector. So we're now told where we can work. We're now told when we can work. We're told what we can do and on whom or who we can do it. And we are then told that, um, we're told what, what we're going to receive and then uh, left, and then but then told that it's up to us then out of that hot mess to try and pay for our own surgeries and our own staff and in the private sector. <laughs> Just... Uh, and they wonder, and they wonder why <laughs> there's no NHS. So that's it. So the short answer is that it's just a case of uh, market forces prevailing, you know. And nobody wins. Department of Health certainly doesn't win. They're not covered in glory in terms of NHS dentistry. The patients don't win. They're losing uh, because they're not only failing to get a service that they think they've paid for, plus, the, plus they're losing all their teeth. So that's a double loss for them. And the profession really just um, ends up moving into the private sector. And seeing far, far fewer patients for less money, I would say, on there than they would on the NHS. But in terms of uh, improved uh, job satisfaction, quite, quite improved job satisfaction. Right, okay, that's it. I'll um, talk to you later. Bye.